Well, we're here to start our second uh, or third of Daniel. That we're going to look at Daniel chapter two, but it's the third of the series of Daniel that we are doing, and this is the second part of Daniel uh, that we're going to be talking about. Daniel chapter two, starting with verse. 24. But before we do that, would you bow with me in prayer? Thanks, God, for this opportunity to look at your words today, and I pray that, God, you would be proclaimed, and we are in awe of what you communicate. And, Lord, may we hear and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're looking at Daniel, and as he uh, has the opportunity, may I say that, the opportunity to share uh, to the king the king's dream, and also its interpretation. Let's look at what uh, Daniel says, starting with Daniel chapter 2, starting with verse 24. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch. When the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon, Daniel said to him, Don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king, and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Arioch quickly told Daniel to the king and said, I have found the one, the captive from Judah, who will tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, there is no wise man, enchanter, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar, what will happen in the future? Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming the coming events. He who reveals dream, secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secrets of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what is in your heart. Now, I'm just going to stop there and talk about this for a moment. I find it interesting that we kind of get a rehash again of what's going on that Daniel was forced into uh, interpreting this dream because they were going to kill him. And he said, hey, if you're going to kill me, why don't you give me an opportunity to, to interpret them? I can do that. And so he comes before the king and says he understands uh, both meaning and also what the dream, um, the meaning of the dream and what the dream is. And so he talks about that. But again, he acknowledges that it's not him, it's God that reveals the dreams. And so that's what goes on. He says, but because God wants you to understand what is in your heart. And this is one of the challenges in my own mind as I'm thinking about this. Why is God telling the King Nebuchadnezzar, who doesn't believe in just one God, in the God of heavens. Now, later on, I do believe he does come to faith in, in God as, the, as that God, but at this point in time, he doesn't. So why is he doing this? Why is God communicating to Nebuchadnezzar? And I think the reason is because he wants Daniel to know. And you might say, well, why didn't he just talk right to Daniel? Um I'm not fully sure I understand why that was, but this is the way God wanted to do that. And uh, also to show that God has power uh, and he will use whatever vessel he wants to use to proclaim who he is as the one and only God. So uh, let's, let's keep moving on here. Verse 31, Daniel says, In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. And its legs were iron. And its feet was a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from the mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace like shaft of a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain and covered the whole earth. So now we see that Daniel has in said what the dream was. Um, and I find it very interesting, the, the different kinds of uh, aspects. First, he also not only says what the dream was, 
But he also acknowledges that it was a frightening sight, that uh, the king was frightened by this. This was this impressive, uh, fearful kind of thing that was built a somewhat monstrous. Um, it was monstrous in terms of how it was. But interesting enough, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and, and we see the most valuable part first of gold being the most of value and then moving on downward. Um, and of course, no one would ever build something like this because this would be not probably a nice looking statue. Uh, and also it would uh, fade away. And it also says some things and we'll get into that in a moment. But we see very clearly that this is the dream uh, and what's going to happen. And it, and it really... Uh, well, let's go into the interpretation in terms of Daniel jumping in. So verse 26, it says, That was the dream. Now we will tell the king what it means. Now it's interesting, he says, we. And some people have said that maybe it was Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, that this was a part of it. But I would argue that this is not we in terms of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but rather it is God. And when he says we, he's, he's putting himself in a place of being a part of what God is saying. Some people have actually said that this is um, the we is, is the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, that's true. But this is Daniel speaking. And I don't know if we're, we can quite take that leap but I think it's the aspect of when he's saying we, it's not that Daniel thinks he's God or that he has a part of the Godhead, but rather that he has a part to play in what God wants to tell. And so that's why that's there. Verse 37, Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and the birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. And after that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all the previous empires. Yet as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes, the feet and the toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron, but while some parts of it, it will be as strong as iron other parts will be as weak as clay this mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix during the reign of these kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered it will crush all these kingdoms into nothing uh, nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushes crushes to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. Um, amazing. We don't hear uh, other times other than uh, in Revelations where God reveals so much of future realities of what's going to happen. Now, I know some people who are, crypt are, are critical of Scripture and not believing that God would tell people uh, future things or let alone even believe in a God would argue, oh, this was written uh, close to the time of uh, Jesus' birth. And I'm here to say that's not true. God is God, and he's going to reveal what he wants to reveal when he wants to reveal it. And so I think this is important for us to, to understand that God wants to reveal this to Daniel, I think, first and foremost. Daniel, who is a follower of God, who is not that many years from 
taken captive and moved to Babylon, and yet he has been faithful to God over these years. And, and as he's, I'm expecting around three to four years now uh, that he's been a captive uh, of um, the Babylonian king. And we see here just the humbleness that he comes before God to tell what's going to happen and, and for him to kind of, whoa. Now, what we didn't know and what Daniel didn't know is he's telling of these different kingdoms and what's going to happen. We know today that um, there were whole processes of things going on, the first being gold, that being Babylon, the second uh, I think most of us, as we look at the scripture, it's talking about that of the um, Greeks and uh, King, um, um, I'm blanking on his name, um, as the main King Alexander, who uh, is one of the main dominant uh, kings uh, conquering, or we had the Medes, excuse me, we had, so we have uh First Babylonian, uh, then we have the Medes and the Persians, then we have the Greeks, and then we have the Romans, that's the fourth one. And then that fifth one, this is the one that most people are struggling with. I'm not really sure uh, who the ten kingdoms are. Um, there's been a lot of different speculations over time. Um, but we do know this, that at the crumbling of those is the reign of God. And this is not... In, in my understanding, the when the church comes about uh, after Jesus went up into heaven, this isn't the church that comes in because uh, God hasn't done everything he wants to do yet. And also, if, if the ten kingdoms were a part of the church, then why would God throw a big rock to destroy uh, and crumble and I'll have all that fade away? I think this is... Uh, these kingdoms, not really sure, but we believe that the, the rock that comes and knocks down is the end of time. And uh, we see later on in chapter 7 and chapter 8 uh, some more discussion about this, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But this is a powerful thing to realize that God wants uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and wants Daniel to know that he's got a plan, and here's the plan he's progressing in, in doing. Um, it, it just takes your breath away to think, whoa, to see out, here's the things that are going to happen, even though they don't know the names or these other uh, empires that are going to take over later on. We, on the other hand, can say, hey, here's these four groups. That, that was the Babylonians, it was the Medes and the Persians, it was the Greeks, it was the Rome Romans and and all we can see that I wish I could tell you and this has been one of the real frustrations for me is what are these ten kingdoms and how is it is are 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 we in the progression of those ten and and at the end of the tenth kingdom then it's then the rocks coming over and we're saying goodbye to the old world and God's coming in it could be or it could be uh, there is kind of this ten kingdom type of thing at the end of of when God comes back again. We just don't fully understand and know that. Um, it's also interesting, it talks about that Babylon is the gold. Um, and, and it's interesting that it's these different base metals that are being used. Uh, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then clay. Um, and then this rock that isn't any kind of a form other than it's just from the earth that comes and takes over everything. I think that's a very interesting thing. It's not made by human hands. Everything else has been formed and shaped and needed to be purified, shall we say, by humans, uh, in which we as humans aren't pure, but God is. And I think that's important. Now, gold, why is it gold? Does that mean that that, that Babylonian kingdom was a better kingdom than that of the Medes and the Persians and so forth going down? Uh, I don't, I don't fully get that, uh, and especially when it says th these other kingdoms are going to be inferior, I'm not sure I fully can comment on that. I do know that Babylon 
had less of a, a conquering area than that of the Medes and the Persians. And I know that the Greeks were uh, a larger group than that. And, and then the Roman Empire even more than that. So there was more territory. So why would these other groups, as you go down the list of from gold to silver to bronze to iron, be less of value? Not sure. It is interesting, at least for the iron, uh, that was something that the Romans definitely used a lot more of than any of the other groups. Um, bronze at at one time was a pretty uh, dominant thing, but as they learned how to do metallurgy better in terms of working it and, and all that iron uh, was a uh, more valuable and more malleable and stronger than that of bronze. Who well, those are some things that I, I wish I could say more on, and I I just don't want to speculate, but I do want you to know that uh, how that inferior levels from things to things, I'm not sure. Some people have said it has to do with that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a, more of a control factor. And as you go down on the list of groups, there was less control by one person because there needed to be more uh, other groups involved. And that's why they're able to have such a dominant force over a larger area. Because let's face it, a small one person or two people controlling everything. It just, you can't do that with so many people. There's no way to do that. But um, that's some speculation as it goes on. But it does say this. I, I appreciate what it says. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. This is something that Daniel says. Hey, he's showing you the future, king. You have the opportunity. To, the dream is true and its meaning is certain. And... Um, Daniel came with confidence. He, when he ends there, he doesn't know. He, he believes that this is it, but the king hasn't responded. And here, look at what the response is in verse 46. The king Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshipped him, and he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burnt sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. But Daniel, excuse me, he made Daniel ruler over the whole providence of Babylon as well as chief over all his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the providence of Babylon while Daniel remained in the king's court. So, we see here that the king is saying, claiming things about God, and yet the the words used and what I think the king understood and believed, not so sure. Sometimes we can say certain things, but not fully accept those things until they come reality later on. And, and I do believe later on, Nebuchadnezzar will believe that the king of kings and the Lord of lords is the God of heavens. And it, he does, yes, he does proclaim uh, God as that at this point, but I don't think he fully gets it. But then he goes on and he, he appoints Daniel to a high position. Just think, I mean, he's probably a teenager or maybe at most uh, low 20s. He's probably, I think, in his teens when he's appointed to this high position. And just think of all the other wise men uh, that he has saved, but yet at the same time, think about the frustrations and, and all that of other people who uh, are lower on the rung now because of what Daniel has done, um, both in terms of a jealous towards him, and yet also Daniel at Daniel's request. So he Daniel acknowledges Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they are also given places of position as well, but in a different capacity. And that's why we then see this in what happens next in Daniel chapter 3, which we'll cover next week. Um, well, I want to end it there because I think it's important for us to keep it short. I, I apologize for being 20 minutes long. I, I wish I could condense this even more, but I do want you to know this. God is going to do what God's going to do, and he wants to invite us into his glory and into his 
kingdom. And if we're willing to trust him and believe him, he will reveal things to us. Not necessarily of the future, but reveal things about who we are and what he has for us. And, and I think that's important today. Let's pray. God, may you reveal to us who you are more and more in our life. And God, we give you praise for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I thank you, God, for these words that are not just of the past, but also the future. For may your kingdom come and may your will be done now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for watching with us, and, and I hope to see you next week as we look at uh, Daniel chapter 3. Bye-bye.